Hey everybody, Pastor Chase here. Uh, If you're here in the room this morning, I'm so glad that you're here to worship with us today. Uh, If you're watching online, then I'm so glad that you tuned into this message. Uh, But before I introduce today's speaker, I just have a couple announcements, uh, two that you've already heard if you've been in here worshiping with us today. First of all, uh, Baptism Sunday is coming up in just a couple weeks. And so this coming Sunday is the last week to sign up for baptisms. And so if you are someone who hasn't yet taken your faith public and you want to be baptized in our outdoor baptism service at Lake Erie on July 16th. Uh, Please let us know. Talk to one of the elders or you can send an email uh, to the email that's here on the screen. And then the second announcement uh, is that this week, later on this week, on Thursday, uh, we're going to be sending out an email with an update about our autonomy process and where we are uh, with that and what's going on. And so uh, if you are someone who calls this church home and you don't get an email on Thursday, uh, please send an email to info at thecornerschapel.com. Uh, and we'll make sure that you get that email as well. So that's this coming Thursday. Uh, Be on the lookout for an email about our process uh, to becoming an autonomous church. Now, uh, I am so glad that you're here to worship with us. I wish that I was here to worship with you, especially to hear uh, from our speaker this morning. And that's one that we all know very well. And it's Nick Buto. Nick Buto is our worship leader, and he's been with us really since the beginning uh, of our church and so excited to hear from him this morning. We are continuing our series, The Story, as we move through the story of the Bible. And I said a couple weeks ago that we've been taking the 50,000 foot view and looking at uh, the Bible from way up here. Uh, But for the next couple weeks, we're diving down into the book of Psalms. And so I hope uh, that you will be encouraged this morning by Nick Buto. I'm sure that you will be encouraged this morning as he brings the word. So without further ado, let's welcome Nick Buto to bring the word this morning. Well, good morning. So excited to be here with you this morning. My name is Cardboard Nick. I mean, Nick Buto. (laughs) I am just kidding, guys. I am not going to let this imposter preach for me. Let's uh, go ahead and start that over, okay? So good morning. My name is Nick Buto, and I am the worship leader here at the Corners Chapel. So excited to be here this morning with you all, bringing you the word for the first time And this is actually the first time ever I've uh, never preached before, so I ask that you would all give me some grace, but I am trusting that the Lord is going to speak through me, and he's going to give me the words that he wants us all to hear in this place. Amen? Well, I've been the worship leader here at the Corners for about three years now, and I'm so incredibly blessed by how God has moved through this body of believers. I'm so happy to be able to call this church family my home. It's just so amazing to see how God has been growing in this church, how he's been moving and uh, just growing the spirits and, and, and maturing all of us and, and growing in numbers as well. So I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to get started, okay? So Lord God, we just thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that you're here. We thank you that your spirit is here, that it's present that it's working through us, that it's moving through us, Lord, and that we have direct access to you. Lord God, we just thank you for this beautiful morning that you've given us, and uh, I just pray that, that you would just speak through me right now, that I would become a vessel. God, that your message would just flow through me effortlessly. And God, I just pray for everyone in this room. I pray for this congregation. Lord, I pray that we would be able to receive this message and learn from it and grow from it. So God, I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So many of you guys might know this uh, sly character standing next to me. Uh, If you don't, his name is Cardboard Nick. Now, Pastor Chase introduced him to us about one year ago. And he's been popping up in everything from uh, Chapel News to some of our outdoor services. Now, he's even tried to replace me a couple of times. But so far, he has not been successful. And I, the Nick who is alive and well, am currently the worship leader here at the Corners. So just like myself, Cardboard Nick has been through a lot. As you can see, he's, he's got some damage. He's not standing as tall and straight as he did back when Pastor Chase introduced us 
to him, but I just want to give a shout out to Paul Bowling, who taped him up and made him look a little bit better. Give Paul a hand. Awesome. Awesome. So he's been through a lot of wear and tear, but there's one particular event that comes to mind when thinking about all that Cardboard Nick has gone through. Now, last summer, Cardboard Nick actually got to serve as a greeter at one of our outdoor services. (laughs) Now, personally, I think he did a great job, but unfortunately, Mr. Cardboard is not as durable as most of us are. Here, I'll show you guys. Ready? No, not durable at all. And and I kind of had to do that because it would be super awkward if he was just up here for the entire sermon staring at you guys. So I feel like that was a necessary action to take. (laughs) But back to the outdoor services. As, As you know, the weather at our outdoor services is completely unpredictable. And during that service Cardboard Nick attended, the Lord provided us with a storm. Now, we weren't expecting that storm, but nevertheless, Cardboard Nick was left alone to defend himself against the elements by himself. And uh, as you saw, the storm took a toll on the body of Cardboard Nick. He's not the same stand-up guy that that he used to be. Um, And what I did right there probably didn't help anything, so he's probably taken some more damage, but uh, you see... There's, there's something that I want to focus in on here, um, and that's the fact that when we turn to Scripture, we also learn a lot about storms. But when we hear about storms talked about in the Word of God, uh, the Word is often referring to storms that we experience in our lives. Now, what do we mean by this? What are we talking about when we talk about storms that we experience in our lives? Well, friends, we're talking about trials. We are talking about tribulations hard times. So let's say a job is lost, a family member has passed away, a relationship has ended. Storms look differently for each person, but friends, the main point is that storms are difficult periods of time in our lives that weather us and break us down. And today we're going to talk a little bit about our response to these storms when they hit. Where where do we turn to find our shelter from the storms of our lives? Where are we finding our protection? Are we turning to media like TV and uh, video games? Are, are we distracting ourselves by scrolling endlessly through social media? Maybe we're turning to some sort of an addiction like a, like a gambling addiction or even an addiction to alcohol or, or pornography. Most of us have been through some sort of storm in our life. In fact, I'll say that all of us have been through some sort of storm. But I want to ask the question right here and right now, what do you turn to when the storms of life hit? Where are you finding your shelter from the storm? And where do you find your protection? In addition, I'll ask this question that we'll be answering today. And that's where does the Bible tell us to find our shelter from the storm? Where does the word of God tell us to turn when we're feeling overwhelmed, when we feel like there's nowhere else that we can turn? Well, friends, our answer is to that question is found in uh, Psalm chapter 91. And that's where we're going to be this morning. You see, friends, when we dive deep into this chapter, we're going to find three things. These three things are going to be our main points for this morning. Uh, We find a truth about God. We find out what happens when we trust God. And we learn about a timeless promise from God. Like I said, these are our three points for this morning. So we're going to get started. And I'm going to uh, talk about the first heading of the first point. And that is this. If you cling to God, you will be protected by God. If you cling to God, you will be protected by God. Turn with me to uh, Psalm chapter 91, and we're going to read together. We're going to start with verses 1 and 2, and they state, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to Yahweh, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So if we look at those two verses right there, right from the top, there are some words that we need to define. First of all, let's take a look at the word abide. 
If we look at this word from a biblical perspective, the word abide actually means to remain or to stay. Another synonym that could be used is to endure. I really love this one because it offers such an incredible perspective on abiding in the shadow of God. This definition gives us the perspective of enduring the storms of our life under the protection of the Almighty God. I want to take some time to look at some more examples of God referring to the word abide. So John 15, 4 That gives us an example of Jesus telling his disciples, and it should be on the screen behind me, but it it states, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. We see in these verses that Jesus gives us an example of a branch being unable to bear fruit unless it remains with the vine, unless it stays with the vine, unless it's enduring the growing process, staying attached to the vine and never parting from it. So in 1 John 2.24, we get another great example of abiding. And uh, this verse reads, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. So so for some context here in 1 John 2.24, this chapter as a whole is warning us against denying that Jesus is the Christ, the one true Savior and uh, the only one who can bring eternal life. We're being instructed in this verse to be intentional about what we have been taught to remain with us. So what what I mean by that is everything that Jesus has taught us in the scriptures, everything that we learn when we turn to the word of God, this verse is instructing for that to remain with us, for it to stay with us. And if we do that, we will remain close to Jesus. All right, so now that we have a pretty good understanding of the word abide, I'd like to take a look at another word within this text. Now, that word is refuge. Now, the word refuge comes from the Hebrew word, and uh, forgive my pronunciation here. I'm going to try my best. I believe it is mahase, and this word actually translates to a shelter from storms and from danger. When we read the Lord is our refuge, we can actually translate this to the Lord is our shelter from the storm. As we've been working through the Psalms together and going through the story together, I just want to take a moment to point out how much of God's word actually refers to God as being a refuge. So the word refuge is actually referenced 88 times throughout the entirety of Scripture. Now, many of these references are in the Psalms, And it's extremely apparent that the psalmists who wrote the psalms want us to know that Yahweh can be trusted in the storms that we experience in life, that we can find shelter and protection when we trust in him and when we abide in him. So at this point, there's only one word that I want to go over. There's only one word that I want to cover, and that is fortress. I don't know about you guys, But when I think about a fortress, I immediately think of medieval times. I'm thinking about a castle with a mighty knight protecting the kingdom, kind of like this guy, Sir Brock the Brave, behind me here. And that's that's a picture from VBS. Uh, Well, here's the thing. Thinking about a castle isn't too far off when we look at the word from a biblical perspective. The word fortress actually comes from the Hebrew word matzud. And this word refers to a castle or a stronghold, a place of defense and protection against large-scale attacks. When we turn to Scripture again, I want to focus in on one psalm in particular that keys in on God being a castle or a safe place. That's Psalm 18, 1 through 3. And this should be on the screen behind me. It states, I love you, Yahweh, my strength. Yahweh is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. 
my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon Yahweh, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. So we're also seeing the word refuge or a fortress in um, this passage. Many of this uh, many of the, the many times in the Psalms, God's protection is the shelter that we find in him when, when it's referenced here. And here's the thing, friends, that shelter is found when we cling to Christ. We must abide in him day by day and walk closely with him. So when we define these words, when we take each word that, that we went over and we really understand them, we're starting to see that if we cling to God, he'll protect us. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this in real life. Let's bring this back to our own lives. So in real life, we see this with babies, right? So over the past year, my wife and I have been adjusting to being foster parents. And, and trust me, this entire process has been an adjustment. We, uh, we, we got two toddlers in, in the course of one weekend, and so we became instant parents overnight. And so it has definitely been an adjustment. But throughout this process of uh, being foster parents, we've gotten to see firsthand how clingy young children can be. Our youngest foster baby will often scream my wife's name every time she tries to leave a room. So I feel so bad for her, honestly. Like, she can't even go to the bathroom without our youngest foster baby. He is, uh, he's almost going to be two here. Uh, she, he just screams her name. My wife's name's Ada. So he's just like, Ada, every single time. And it's so obvious that our youngest foster kid clings to my wife because he finds protection with her. Another great example are babies' first words. So who in here is a parent? Raise your hand. Okay, nice, nice. We got a lot of parents. All right, so let's take, let's take uh, your first child, right? So whose child's first word was mama? Okay, okay. How about dada? Oh, man, that's a lot more hands. Okay, okay. Well, regardless of the answers you guys provided, I'm pretty sure that nearly every child's first words are either mama or dada. And, and I've seen parents make a battle of it sometimes. I mean, they, they're, they're fighting over uh, what, what name the child will say first. And we see this once again in babies because babies are clinging to their parents. They are abiding with them. You see, friends, we are the fortresses and the refuge of our children. Psalm 91 is calling us as Christians to find as much refuge in Christ as babies have in their parents. Now think about that. Uh, think about that for a minute. The parents of a baby are that baby's entire world. They are the center of that child's life. As Christians, I believe it's important to ask ourselves, are we making Christ the center of our lives? Because if you cling to God, he will protect you. And there's another action that we need to take in order to receive God's full protection. And that action is trust. And that's going to lead us straight into our second point. That second point is, if you trust God, he will fully protect you. If you trust God, he will fully protect you. Let's dive back into our passage again. I'm going to read verses 3 through 13 this time. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not find fear, or you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side. 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague should come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. 
On their, hand, on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. So as we look deeper at these verses, I think it's important to remind ourselves that the Psalms are poetry, right? The Psalms are actually song lyrics. I love the way that C.S. Lewis puts it, and this quote should be behind me on the screen here. It says, most empathetically, the Psalms must be read as poems, as lyrics with all the licenses and all the formalities, the hyperboles, the emotional rather than the logical connections, which are proper to lyric poetry. Otherwise, we shall miss what is in them and think we see what is not. Given a, uh, what C.S. Lewis has said, it's important to remember that we must view these passages as poetry. And poetry can be easily misunderstood if it's taken too literally. For example, let's take a closer look uh, just this time at verses 9 and 10. Okay, so it says, Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. So I want to make this clear. This verse is not saying that nothing bad will ever happen to us if we abide in God. It isn't telling us that our lives will be perfect if we trust in God. It's not saying that if we trust God enough, we'll never get sick, that we'll never fall ill. I think that we saw a really good example of Christians maybe taking this verse a little bit too literally back in 2020 when COVID was really starting to get bad and we were experiencing a global pandemic. I want to make it clear that yes, we trusted in God throughout the pandemic and we believed in his sovereignty. We believe that God is a healer and that he's capable of doing anything. However, when we look at verses 9 and 10 and we look at our own lives, right, we must not hold the mindset of if we get sick, we aren't trusting God enough. That is not the mindset that we should take. At this point, these verses, and the point that these verses are trying to make is that when we trust God, we are given the assurance of an eternal life spent with him. And friends, we must understand the gravity of the sacrifice that was made on the cross for us. And when we grasp the magnitude of the reward that was given to us, that we didn't deserve, we, we realize that, that all we have to do is trust in him. And we have to realize the, the, the gravity of that reward that we didn't deserve. I think that Charles Spurgeon really sums this up exceptionally in this point, and this one should be behind me on the screen as well. It says, it is impossible that any ill should happen to the man who is beloved of the Lord. The most crushing calamities can only shorten his journey and hasten him to his reward. Ill to him is no ill, but only good in a mysterious form. Losses enrich him. Sickness is his medicine. Reproach is his honor and death is his gain. No evil in the strict sense of the word can happen to him, for everything is overruled for good. Yeah, I think that's an awesome quote. And I think that when we take a look back at our own lives and the experiences that we've had, we find that uh, we've been through plenty of storms. I know firsthand, I can, I can tell you from experience that when I look back at my life and all of the experiences that I've had, it hasn't really been a smooth road from the very start. And I wanted to take some time to share my story with you all. Some of you guys may have heard my story before, uh, but if you haven't, I would love the opportunity to share it with you. And more importantly, as we go into this, I, I just want to share the ways that the Lord has moved through this story. This is a testimony, and, and I want to focus in on the ways that God has moved through my life. So when I was three months old, there's a picture of me when I was three months old. I was pretty cute. <laughs> my parents were not prepared for the storm that they were about to go through. Obviously, I can't remember things uh, when I was that age. It looks like I have about one brain cell back there. But, um, but regardless, I'm well aware right now of the outcomes that occurred because of what happened to me when I was that age. When I was just an infant, 
I was diagnosed with meningitis and encephalitis. Now, these diseases caused me to have a stroke when I was only three months old, and the stroke caused me to develop epilepsy and a mild cerebral palsy. So essentially, really, this is kind of like the worst kind of medical domino effect. It's just one bad thing happening after another. The seizures that I experienced from the epilepsy, they, they, were, they were sometimes pretty severe, but they were pretty infrequent. However, when I reached the age of about 10 or 11, my seizures took a turn for the worst. At that point, I was experiencing almost 20 seizures a day, and uh, these seizures started out really mild, but they progressively got worse to the point where I was falling down and I was, I was harming myself. It was really bad. Now, at first, uh, the doctors, they, they told my parents that these seizures were fake. They said I was faking them for attention. They called them pseudo-seizures. But it became very apparent that uh, when they became so frequent and when I started falling, that these were not fake and some sort of action needed to be taken. So once, once we looked into it, once my parents got the medical attention that was needed, they were really given two options. There was option one, I have brain surgery. It's a, a really serious brain surgery too, we'll talk about it, but option two was I'm gonna wear a helmet for the rest of my life. <laughs> so that's not really good at all. So um, really, I can't even imagine what my parents were going through. Um, and, and they had nowhere to turn besides the throne of God in this situation. This trial forced my family to cling to Christ and walk with him through this storm. Obviously, you know, wearing, wearing that helmet, that's just, that wasn't going to happen. So my parents did decide to get the brain surgery. Here, here's a picture around the time that I had the surgery done. That's me and my dad and my brother. And honestly, I, I remember being so carefree during that time. Um, I'd gone through several surgeries already, and I just thought it was so cool how you would count down from 10 to zero, and by the time you got to zero, you were just out. I, I wasn't even thinking about the fact that they were about to take a peach-sized chunk out of my brain. I mean, we're talking about a fourth of my brain here. And um, we can take a moment to praise the Lord because the surgery did get rid of the seizures. So let's, let's praise the Lord for that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. However, it, it didn't come without a price. I, I lost the use of my left arm completely. Now, because of the stroke that I had when I was three months old, I already had kind of like this limited use of my arm, but losing it completely was really tough, and, and I did struggle a lot with adjusting to normal life. I really believe that this trial, this, this storm, led my parents so much closer to the Lord um, and I was able to grow up in a church family, and I grew close to the Lord throughout my adolescence. I absolutely loved going to church as a kid, but there was one aspect of church that I really, really, really loved, and that was the worship. Now, within the worship, being a kid, I was just really uh, into the drummer. I just thought the drummer was so cool, and I just wanted to be like the drummer. And um, I remember I also at the same time was kind of like developing this innate sense of rhythm and I would just constantly tap on things, right? I was tapping on like my desks at school. I was tapping on pots and pans. And uh, really, I just wanted so badly to learn how to play the drums. But, you know, that's a little complicated. There was one big problem. I could you only use one arm and that, that, I mean, that was impossible. There was no way I was going to learn how to play the drums. Well, as I grew into my young teens, I grew closer to the Lord, and I constantly remember praying, praying. I would pray, God, please heal my arm because I want to play the drums so bad. I just want to learn how to do it. I just wish that you would heal this arm, and, um, and I would pray that he would give me the skills to be able to do it. Um, I had a friend who had a drum set, and I would go over, go, go over there all the time, and I'd practice. I, and I found out there were a lot of ways that I could overcome the barriers that I was experiencing, and I slowly, slowly started learning to play. And at the same time, attending church and youth group all the time, I was feeling this really intense calling to enter the worship ministry. So I was, I was being pressed with this calling to, to join the worship team, even though I really didn't know how to play yet. Now, if you guys think that my parents, if, if they bought a drum set right away, you are sadly mistaken. 
<laughs> there, it was a lot of convincing, and I'm talking about a lot. I really had to show them that I could play with one hand. But eventually they did buy me a kit, and I was playing on the worship team one-handed within a few months. I think we have some pictures back here of me in high school playing the drums. Um, as time went on, I also realized that I love to sing, and um, I also really love to write music. And um, I soon learned that I, I love doing this even more than I love playing the drums. I, I, I loved singing and writing songs even more. And so the Lord opened up doors, door after door, of, of me just being able to be a part of worship ministries, being able to serve on worship teams. And eventually he led me here to the corners. And I'm so incredibly thankful for that, that I have a place where I can just lead people in worship every single week. I'm just so thankful how God has blessed our team that we've, uh, we've kind of fostered this culture of songwriting within our team. We've had several of our team members write songs and record them, and, and it's, it's so awesome that I get to use this gift that God gave me back when I was a teenager. And more importantly, it's so awesome that God is working through me in, in this worship team to do that. And I really want to emphasize the fact that this was a storm in my life. All of this that I went through, all of these, these medical issues that I had, these were storms. And it was a storm that the Lord worked through. He was over the storm, and he was guiding it with his sovereign hand every step of the way. He was with us the entire storm, walking through, us, th walking through it with us. And it's apparent that God was glorified by my testimony. And, and once again, I just want to say all of that glory goes to him. All of that glory goes to him. But there's something in particular for today's message that I want to key in on. And that's the fact that God didn't protect me from the meningitis. He didn't protect me from the encephalitis, from the stroke, the seizures, or the brain surgery. God didn't protect me from this storm. So here's the thing. God promises his protection. So why wasn't I protected from what I went through? Well, friends, that's bringing us to our final point. And we're going to talk about this timeless truth that we learn about in Psalm 91. And that's that God's protection isn't always external, but it is always eternal. God's protection isn't always external, but it is always eternal. So let's read together the final verses of Psalm chapter 91. Verses 14 through 16, they state, Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, there's something in here that I want to point out right away, and that's that the speaker is changing in these final verses. Verses 1 through 13 are being uh, spoken through the point of view of the psalmist. In verses 14 through 16, we get a message from the perspective of Yahweh himself. When it says, I will deliver him, I will answer him in trouble, I, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is God talking about what he will do when we hold fast to him and abide with him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. With long life. Well, I mean, what, what kind of life is he talking about here? Is he saying that we're all going to live to be past the ripe old age of 95 years old? Or is he talking about something different? Well, friends, I want to let you know that he is talking about our eternal life in this passage. I alluded to this earlier in the message, but I want to key back in on it. And that's that God is referring to the gift we have been given because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us on the cross. He is talking about the fact that all our debts have been paid and we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We may struggle here on earth. You know what? No, I, I will, I'll take that back and I, I'm going to say we will struggle here on earth. 
We will get sick. We will experience loss and pain and sadness of some type. We will go through storms, but we have something incredible to look forward to. We can live this life with the assurance that we will enter the kingdom of heaven and sit at the right hand of Christ. We're going to worship him every day, constantly being in his presence. We're talking about a place where sadness doesn't exist, where loss and pain are nowhere to be found. And that is our hope. And that's why we must trust in God while we're here and have faith in his promises. Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, we must trust and believe and realize that this gift is truly free. It doesn't cost anything, and it's available to us at all times. So I'm going to ask, a, I'm going to ask four questions, okay? And, and with this, I'm, I'm going to start to close. I'm going to start to uh, end us out here. And number one, have you trusted in Christ? Number two, is your hope in your eternal security your protection? Number three, are you walking in the shadow of the Almighty? And number four, are you abiding in him and clinging to him? We must take the step of faith to truly devote ourselves to a life spent with Christ. And, and what does that mean? What does a life spent with Christ mean? It means spending time with him in his word. It means coming to him in prayer and talking to him, conversing with him, and getting to know him. You see, friends, he reveals himself to us in his word. And it's so simple. All we have to do is call upon his name from a standpoint of humble surrender. All we have to do is say, Jesus... I need you. I need your protection. I need to abide in the shadow that you provide because I can't make it through the trials of this life on my own, and I can't do it with, without you by my side. So let's come back to our sad-looking friend down here, Cardboard Nick. Imagine that during that outdoor service when the storms hit, he was sheltered and he was protected by the, or from the elements. I'm taking a guess that he would not look as shabby as he does right now. I want us to understand that we have direct access to a God that can protect us from any element that we face due to the promise and the truth of eternal life that he's given us. So maybe you're in a place right now where you're hearing this for the first time. And I'm sure that you have a lot of questions. I want to assure you that there are plenty of people here at the corners that would love to talk to you more about this. We have a table in the back that's specifically set aside for prayer. Um, I and several other people uh, from our leadership will be at a table out in the lobby called the outlet table. And we would love to talk to you more about questions that you may have. But right here, Right now, if you're feeling challenged at all by what I'm saying, please join me in praying this prayer. Let's bow our heads together. King Jesus, I stand before you as a broken person, a sinner. I'm not worthy of the gift that you've offered me, but nevertheless, you've offered it, and I want to receive it. I'm ready to take the step of faith to devote my life to you completely and live under the shadow that you provide. I want to live under the protection that you provide, under the assurance that no matter what happens in this life, I will have an eternal life spent with you. Help me to know you deeper, to walk with you day by day, and to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. Well, I think that we can all agree that the year 2020 was kind of a storm in itself. And during that storm, the Lord actually laid a song on my heart. And many of the lyrics of this song in particular come directly from Psalm chapter 91. And the title of the song is actually called Psalm 91. 
So in a moment, the worship team and I are going to uh, share that song with you, and we're going to worship together one more time. Uh, But before we do that, I've got a video to share with you just about some other storms that other individuals went through and um, how they overcame those storms and got through them by trusting in God. So let's check out that video. I felt really scared. I don't belong. I didn't know how I was going to pay the bills. I had missed it. I had enough fun, and it wasn't fun anymore. I completely lost it. I just don't know how to live. I'm going to die. I saw the gun. Sharks, I haven't really been scared of them. Found myself signed to the Pentagon. I find work on the North Tower of the World Trade Center. I became a prostitute. I went on a couple calls. I brought home a nice wad of money. My boyfriend was there. And I set my purse on the table. And he told me to break myself. And I said, what did you say to me? He said, break yourself. I got in a verbal confrontation with a guy I played basketball with, and I thought it was going to be just that, a verbal confrontation. Halloween of 2003, we were just surfing, waiting for waves, and I was kind of sitting out further than everyone else. September 11, 2001, rolls in. It's 8.40 in the morning, and I'm standing by this fax machine trying to send some documents out to one of our offices in Philadelphia, when I hear this incredible explosion. The morning of September 11th, I'm seven or eight steps out when Flight 77 is deliberately crashed at the Pentagon. He said, break yourself. And that means give me all your money, dump your purse out on my lap. And I wasn't having it because I was risking my life every night. It escalated. I threw up my guards thinking we were going to fight. And he pulled out a 357 Magnum. This plane had just come crashing into the World Trade Center. The building starts shaking violently. Fire breaks out all around us. We hear an explosion. This is the second plane crashing into the second tower. I'm thrown around, tossed around like a rag doll inside, set ablaze. I was burned on 60% of my body with about 40% being 30 reburns. He choked me in the kitchen and then drug me out by my hair to the back, threw me on the porch, and they started kicking me. This is pimpin' B. I don't know what you thought what time it is, but what time it is now is you're gonna pay me, whether you like it or not. Within a split second, the shark came and took my arm, and I didn't really have time to think. I guess the first shot was so deafening, I don't even recall hearing the trigger being pulled three times. I come down. 81 floors of the North Tower. I see hundreds of bodies of people that jumped out of the buildings. I'm trying to reach my wife. My wife worked on the other tower, but cell phones just wouldn't work. Him and his friends cut all my hair off, stripped me completely nude, spit on me. You can see flesh hanging off the arms. My fellow comrades each grab a limb and go to pick me up, but I don't come with them. They pull chunks off of me, and I begin screaming at them to leave me alone. I lay there pleading with the Lord to finish what terrorists had started, pleading for the mercy of death. I just remember getting shot in my shoulder, in my neck, in my hand. I guess I was instantly paralyzed because I didn't feel any pain. I had lost about 60% of my blood. I turned back, and this is a North Tower. Collapsing. I was told I would never walk again. Told me that I would die if I was going to work Las Vegas and mercilessly beat me for hours. My nose broke, my ribs broke. Just came alive, scorched beyond recognition. I was just praying and trying to stay alive. I had questions for God like, why me? And I'm sitting right in the middle of one of the streets of New York City, wondering, God, for sure my wife is dead. And in 20 plus years of military service, The hardest thing I've ever been asked to do is say goodbye to my son. I've got a tube in every orifice in my body, and I mean every. But I can see him walk in, and he just mouths, speaks to me, says, I love you, Dad. And I can sit there and mouth back to him how much I loved him. 
and I'd go home and I would just cry and I would get in the shower and I would scrub my body and I would think I'll never ever be clean. I knew it was over. And I saw my family. I saw my funeral. And I was in the coffin. And everybody was crying and they were wiping their faces and they were saying, she was just a prostitute. That's what I said, Jesus. Please save me. I don't know if you're real, but I don't want to die. In that moment, I was having my it is finished moment. And as hard as that was, to physically and emotionally say goodbye to my son. I think about how difficult it must have been for God the Father to say goodbye to the son for three days. As I was getting into the ambulance, um, there was a local paramedic. He whispered in my ear and said, God will never leave you nor forsake you. And, um, I think that really just helped me hold it together. It was the first time I really had that type of conversation with God. He just told me, you know, you're gonna go through fiery trials, even if I choose God, but I will give you peace and understanding. I didn't know if I was gonna be able to surf again or not. And so that just like helped me just um, to trust in the Lord and know that He's just gonna guide me and life will move on. I had to make one of the hardest decisions in my life. I would have to forgive the guy that shot me. It was embarrassing at first because everybody thought I was the weaker person because I let him do this to me and didn't get him back. But it was that peace. And with that peace, uh, it seemed like God just started lining things up. And it was all out of me being obedient. I knew God gave me a second chance. Yes, I was a hooker. Yes, I was a prostitute but no longer I'm redeemed. Dust, smoke, ash, balls of fire rising out of ground zero. I had now given up hope about my pregnant wife. My cell phone rings for the very first time that day. I picked up the call with a lot of fear, thinking that would be the worst news of my life. But when I said hello, it's my wife on the other side. A life was spared. That night, me and my wife, before we tried to get any sleep, we knelt down by a bed. I said, God, here's a surrendered life. Would you rewrite the story of my life? What I've learned is that with God's love and with Christ in you, you can overcome any obstacle, any abuse, any hatred, any challenges in your life, and able to forgive and continue to love others like Christ loved you. I don't look too bad for a guy who got run over by a 757. My name is Annie Lobert. My name is Brian Birdwell. My name is Bethany Hamilton. My name is Sujo John. My name is Tyrone Flowers, and I am second. So awesome. 
I absolutely love these videos of these stories of just individuals who have been through some incredible storms and how now they trust in the Lord. Now they're trusting in the protection that he provides. And that protection, like we said earlier, is not necessarily external, but it is eternal. And now that we can focus on our eternal reward and, and getting as many people to that eternal re reward as possible. That is our mission. And that's why we're here. That's why we're living. We're living for Christ and to see others come to him. But the, the lyrics of, of this song that we're going to sing together, it really focuses on, on the fact that we are not to fear. We have nothing to fear. And realize, friends, that with this eternal reward that I've just talked about, that is the truth. We have nothing to fear because even in death, we have victory. Even in pain and loss, we can, we can praise him. So let's stand together. We're going to sing this final song. In you, 
in you for you're our defender it's you we have nothing to fear we have nothing to fear us, Lord, you always stay with us. You are so good, God. You sustain us, never leave us. God, protector of the weak, mighty fortress, king of glory. Lord, you bring us to our knees. You sustain us. You sustain us. Never leave us. God, protect us. give them some praise for the shelter that you provide. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's message. I hope it was a blessing to you. I hope it was an encouragement to you. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will just continue to use these words throughout the week to equip you in your walk with Jesus. If you have any more questions about who we are or how you can get plugged in, uh, be sure to go to our website, thecornerschapel.com. We'd love to hear from you, especially we'd love to hear how we can pray for you. Uh, and if this message was an encouragement to you, I hope that you can share it with someone else and be a blessing to them this week. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe button to see more uh, future sermons and other videos that come out on this channel. And I hope that you have a great week. Be blessed.